So happy Sabbath once again, and uh, welcome to this second session for the day. After the first session, in which we are continuing with our series on justification by faith, and we want to look at uh, as the arm is to the body. So as usual, before we begin, I request that we find a place, if possible, I will kneel so that we can have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Jehovah God, we come before you once again to thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to see this Sabbath, Father, a sign of your sanctifying power upon our lives. Father, may you continue to open our minds, Father, that we might see the deep things out of thy word, and even through the Holy Spirit to make them part of our lives. Be with us as we want to go through this study. For these are prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. So we want to continue with our lessons on justification by faith. Uh, sorry, I'm not feeling very well, but by the grace of God, I know we will continue and finish. And uh, I will begin by quoting some of the statements that we have read in the past. And I'll start with the statement in the book, Testimonies, Volume 1. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 469 and 470. 469 and 470, which says that uh, one important work of, one important part of the work of the ministry, one important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully represent to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same work. So here Ellen White is saying that one important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same the same work they should not fail to adopt it themselves and should urge it upon all who profess to believe the truth thanks uh, Sammy for sharing because I had a tablet so here Notice carefully what it is saying before we begin, that an important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message. That is as part and parcel of the same work. And then in First Testimonies, page 486, First Testimonies, page 486. She says, the health reform I was shown, the health reform I was shown is a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it 
as are the arm and hand with the human body, from where we get our title for the day. So here, it is as closely connected with the third angel's message, as are the arm and the hand with the human, with the human body. Then, lastly, we will read from, for example, last day events, page 199, this statement that you have read in the past. Several have written to me inquiring Last day events, page 199, paragraph four. So that we can put all this together. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. So health reform is closely connected to the third angel's message as part and parcel of the message. Now the third angel's message is justification by faith in the verity. So what, what does that mean? It means that health reform and justification by faith are closely connected, if not the same thing. How is health reform connected to the third angel's message? That is what we want to look at now. We want to try and look at what Ellen White meant because from the statements, we cannot uh, fail to come to the conclusion that health reform and justification by faith are one and the same and the same thing. And notice, we are reading justification and not sanctification. Because most of us, when we heard this message and accepted it, what we've been hearing is that the message can be put as part of sanctification and not justification. But here Ellen White is clear that it is part and parcel of the third angel's work, of the third angel's uh, message. So we want to understand how close is this relationship between health reform and justification by, by faith so that we can understand what is it that the remnant people had received. And this we can only understand by looking at how light comes to our people. In the book of, in the book of, uh, In the book of uh, Second Peter three eighteen. Second Peter three eighteen. We are told, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we are to grow in grace. And not just grace, but also in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is a principle that to understand what we want to look at today, we need to understand that this is something that Christians ought to understand. And then it will solve so many problems that they have, especially Christians that are living in the last days and the Christians that are supposed to be preparing for translation, or rather for the second coming of Christ Jesus. We need to understand this so that we can be able to understand the permissive will of God 
and also the express will of God. That while God allowed some things that were not his express will, in these last days, he requires all the light to shine upon his people. Then they will be prepared for the reception of his son when he comes the second time. I want us to go through the book, The Great Controversy, page 297. Just to look at what happened as the reformation took place. The Great Controversy, page, say page 297. That is 1888, the 1888 one, published in 1888, page 297, paragraph one. Where it says, the great principle so nobly advocated. Yes, the great principle so nobly advocated by Robinson and Roger Williams, that truth is progressive that Christians should stand ready to accept all the light which may shine from God's holy word, was lost sight by their descendants. The Protestant churches of America and those of Europe as well, so highly favored in receiving the blessings of the Reformation, failed to press forward in the path of reform. So a few men arose from time to time, which we will not take much time to look at, we will just mention them. There are several chapters in that book, The Great Controversy. I, I don't know whether this is the one that is titled Pilgrim Fathers. And then there is one that deals with Puritans. Explains well these principles that we are looking at. So it continues, that though a few faithful men rose, arose from time to time to proclaim new truth and expose long cherished error, the majority, like the Jews in Christ's day, or the Papists in the time of Luther, were content to believe as their fathers had believed and to live as they had lived. Therefore, religion again generated into formalism and errors and superstitions which would have been cast aside had the church continued to walk in the light of God's word were retained and cherished. Thus the spirit inspired by the reformation gradually died out until there was almost as great need of reform in the Protestant churches as in the Roman church in the time of Luther. So what was there? There was the same wildness and spiritual stupor, a similar reverence for the opinions of men and substitution of human theories for the teaching, teachings of God's word. So here we see that Robinson and Roger Williams had uh, the same principles that we have read from the book of Second Peter, that Christians should stand ready to accept all the light which may shine from God's holy word, holy word. Unfortunately, the descendants of these reformers were content to just stop where their, the reformers had stopped. Now these principles set forth, sets forth some very dangerous uh, thing. That light, when God brings light and it is rejected, that light soon blinds and turns to darkness. We read that the Reformation did not bring all the light. The same book, Psalm page 291, paragraph three, where we read the statement or the prayer by John Robinson, a pastor who was praying for his members, bidding them farewell as they took exile to travel to the land of America. Great Controversy, page 291, the 1888 edition.
page 291. Brethren, we are now where the prayer itself Yes. Listen to how he prays that, brethren, we are now here long to part asunder, and the Lord knoweth whether I shall live ever to see your faces more. But whether the Lord hath appointed that or not, I charge you before God and his blessed angels to follow me no further than I have followed Christ. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of his, be as ready to receive it. Be as ready to receive it as you ever were to receive any truth by my ministry. For I am very confident that the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth out of his holy word. For my part, I cannot sufficiently bewail the condition of the reformed churches, who are come to a period in religion and will go no further than the instruments of their reformation. Now this last part is what I want us to get. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go any further than what Luther saw. And Calvinists, you see, stick fast where they were left by that great man of God, who yet saw not all things. This is a misery much to be lamented. For though they were burning and shining lights in their time, yet they penetrated not into the whole counsel of God. But were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. This is the condition of the Reformed churches. They did not want to accept any more light. They reached where the Reformers reached and they were content with that, not knowing, the pastor here is saying, not knowing that if the Reformers were alive, and living then, they will be willing to embrace further light as that which they had first done what? As that which they had first received. The Bible in the book of Isaiah 60 speaks of a time when light is going to shine and the glory of God will cover the earth. Here we see that that time had not come because truth or the coming out of darkness of Babylon has been progressive. Even Luther himself did not have all the light, even on justification. Because the justification that Luther had was not the one that is part of the third angel's message. It was the time had not come. Yes, it was light amidst the darkness, but there was something different that we have been seeing all along here. In fact, it says, in the book, Great Controversy, still on Great Controversy, is what we will be reading portions of. Page 253. Page 253. Where well, is the great doctrine of justification? That paragraph that was reading here down there, the great doctrine of justification by faith, so clearly taught by Luther, had almost had been almost wholly lost sight of. Huh? and of the Romish principle of trusting to good works for salvation had taken its place. Whitfield and the Wesleys, who are members of the established church, were sincere seekers for the favor of God. And this they had been taught was to be secured by a virtuous life and an observance of the ordinances of religion. I think I was, this is the chapter I was reading. You continue down, down there. It says that the other day, Charles Wesley fell ill and anticipated death. And then when he was asked upon what he rested his hope of eternal life, his answer was, I have used my best endeavors to serve God. And as the friend who had put the question was not fully satisfied, Wesley thought, what are not my endeavors, my works 
sufficient ground of hope? Will God rob me of these good works that I have done? I have nothing else to trust. Such was the dense darkness that had settled down on the church, hiding the atonement, robbing Christ of his glory, and turning the minds of men from their only hope of salvation, the blood of the crucified redeemed. If you read that chapter, it continues to tell you how God brought to Wesley step by step because there was a time when they were in a sheep, I think, and they were with, uh, I don't know whether they were coming from, they were some coming from Germany. And they were so calm and it was, there was a storm and he's asking them, why are you not afraid to die? Are your kids also not afraid to die? They say, no, we are not afraid of them because they had trusted only in the righteousness of Christ. So here we see that the great doctrine of justification by faith that had been taught by Luther had almost been lost sight of. And these were by reformers like Wesley. Very sad situation. You continue to page 61 and 62, I'm just mentioning. It says that the Wesleys were preaching, started, got into, uh, got the truth, were led into the truth, and they started preaching the law. Not as the root of faith now, but as the fruit of faith. Because there was no way people then would claim to be righteous when actually prior to that, most of them were saying that the law had been done away with, antinomialism. So what is just and what is righteous? Because we know that righteousness or justification by righteousness actually is obedience to the law. And therefore, there was no way they could accept to be justified when they did not even understand what the law was. Otherwise, they were accepting something of which they were ignorant. Righteousness is obedience to the law. So you find that here they amplified the concept of sin. And when sin abounded, we are, the Bible says that grace abounded even more. The place of the law in justification is very important. Because if they had a limited grasp of the law, the requirements of the law, it means that they also ended up having a limited experience. They had been forgiven little and therefore they loved little. So the law had to be magnified and then justification also had to be made great. Read about that in a chapter the great controversy, talking about the Puritans. And then you come to 1840, when William Miller and different people throughout the world give the judgment our message that was simply asking the people, the Lord is coming. Are you ready to meet him in your justification if you believe that you are really justified? And we see that the churches closed their doors to these preachers and William Miller because it was revealed to them that their justification was inadequate. They were not ready to meet Christ. Simply means that if you really believe that you are justified, it means that you are ready to meet Christ at any time. So when these people showed that they were not ready to meet Christ, their justification was not adequate to have Christ come and take them home. So a different understanding of justification had to be brought. God had to enlighten people that for them to be ready for the second coming of Christ, they must have a different understanding of justification. And after that, the great disappointment you find that it was not long that a higher standard of righteousness was brought in. The Sabbath, as part of the law, was emphasized. It was a higher standard of righteousness. It was a new concept of righteousness. Because it was not just about the day, but it was about the creator, of which the day was a sign 
of his sanctification for those who had been justified by faith in Christ Jesus. It was about the God of the Sabbath, the creator who produces life and who can recreate sanctified by Christ Jesus. Come 1888, from the statement that we have also read, the devil had twisted the law to the extent that Ellen White was saying that we have preached the law until we were as dry as the hills of Gilboa. So by 1888, the preachers had become like the Jews, where the law was good works that we do in order for us to be saved. And if you listen to like we have had what led to the confusion and even eventual rejection of the message by Wagona and Jones, if you remove all this uh, confusion, you find that the real issue was Wagona was telling, especially these leaders of the church, that their obedience to the law, their righteousness, to the law that they depended upon for salvation was nothing but filthy dance. And he was saying that Christ is the law, the law lived out, and righteousness is becoming like Christ. The standard of righteousness is Jesus. He is righteousness. Jesus is the one who is righteousness. That was not going to live out obedience. In fact, that was the only way that was going to ensure that they manifest this justification in obedience to all the laws of God. And therefore, you find that this was the confusion that took place in 1888. Right standing before God, being justified, meant to receive Jesus Christ, the righteousness that is, that is demanded that meets the standards required by the law, then we do not go back to establish our own righteousness. So it made uh, righteousness not just objective living, but also having a personal relationship with Christ Jesus. Then came the health message. Not after 1888, health message was prior to that. And that is what we want to look at. It was just establishing the context that light is usually progressive. And we must ensure, like we have been told, we are to be faithful in preaching the health message as part and parcel of the third angel's message, which is justification by faith. So after the great disappointment, after the people were led to see the work of Christ, in the heavenly sanctuary came the message of health and temperance. And here is where there is a problem where many say naturally that belongs to sanctification and not justification. But what we have read the statements from Ellen White, it says it is part of the third angel's message, which is justification by faith. Now, if you read from the book, Our Health Message, Adventists before 1853 were chewing tobacco, tobacco, were taking tea and smoking cigars, because some of them were being told by their doctors that that was medicine. Somebody like Lobo ate pork three times a day. By 1858, still you'll find articles where James White is saying that there are people who are still smoking tobacco yet cannot save money for the work of evangelism. Bates was the foremost when it came to issue of reform. So you find that gradually the light was coming to the people of God. The distinction between clean and unclean meats came. In fact, by 1870, we are told that Adventists were still robbing God in tithes and offerings. So these things that we have been born and, and we received, we need to understand that it was light that came gradually. You cannot imagine, someone cannot imagine today that an Adventist 
was chewing tobacco, did not understand the issue of health reform at the beginning of this movement. Not strange, Ellen White herself read in the book Councils on Diets and Food, used to eat flesh. And when the light came, she explains how she struggled until the body was subject to the higher powers of the mind. You know, some of us just think that this church, I don't know what people imagine. And this is why it is important people to read, especially this book, The Great Controversy. So you can see how God leads out a people. And that the light that has come is not necessarily what was required for people in the past when that time they were coming from darkness and it was not possible to give them all the light because it was going to blind them. So it was emerging light. Tithes and offerings. In fact, even these other churches, they did not have the concept in them. Unfortunately, when it came to health reform, most Adventists thought again that these were new rules that they could keep in order to be good Adventists and to secure their salvation. So we had many legalistic, healthy Adventists who obeyed these health reform rules in order to be saved. And they reasoned that it was good to be better to be a good legalistic health reformer than not a health reformer. But we want to, fit, to look at the motivation for the light on health reform as we finish. Because God had a different plan. God had a different uh, purpose for sending this light on health reform. And you want to look at how it is related to justification by faith. We have seen in the past that justification is by faith is the third angel's message in verity and not sanctification. They want to look at how close this relationship uh, is. Because if you look at it carefully, you will not fail to see that this light was given to raise the standard of righteousness and thus of justification. Because if justification by faith, in justification by faith, God saves from everlasting death. If you are saved from everlasting death, the only other option is what? Is everlasting life. And if you've been given everlasting life, assured of everlasting life, it means that you've been given a title to heaven. So, and that is why we read from the spirit of prophecy that justification is our title to what? To heaven, because we inherit it. But not, notice what it says in the book, uh, Desire of Ages. Eh? Notice what it says in the book, Desire of Ages, eh? that sometimes we fail. We fail uh, to see. Let me just find it. it says um, yes, desire of ages, page six hundred and sixty, paragraph three. You wonder how we have sometimes failed to really understand what we are. Our Lord has said, yeah? except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is true of our physical nature. To the death of Christ, we owe even this earthly life. The bread we eat is the purchase of his broken body. The water we drink is bought by his spilled blood. Not one saint or sinner 
not one saint or sinner eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf. It is reflected in every water spring. All these Christ has taught in appointing the emblems of his great sacrifice. The light shining from that communion service in the upper chamber makes sacred the provisions for our daily life. The family board becomes as the table of the Lord, and every meal a sacrament. What? You know, we have had this thought that we spiritualize things in the Bible to the extent that we think that life eternal is something that is to be put far off because it is going to happen to us in future. It has got nothing to do with what we are, with the life that we live today. But here we are seeing that were it not for the death of Christ on Calvary, none of us will be alive today. Never, never one saint or sinner eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. Whether the sinner realizes it, he is alive even for this temporal period, whether he will end up accepting Christ or not, he is alive courtesy of the sacrifice that Christ made at Calvary. Now reading this quote makes you think, what? This is a different perspective. Even for my temporal provision, I mean, I owe it to the death of Christ on Calvary. Life then becomes precious once you understand this. Life becomes something that must be preserved. Because if for me to live even this temporal life, it is Christ that had to die, then I will not be careless with this life. I will ensure that I take care of this body so that I can offer more service, both to God and to my fellow human beings. There will be none of us were it not for the death of Christ. And therefore you begin to love life. For God has provided it at a great cost. And health cannot be separated from life. Because unless you want to say that life includes a miserable existence where you are in and out of hospital because of breaking the laws of health, life cannot be separated from health. Health is, by the way, the greatest treasure that man can be able to have. Whether you are rich, whether you are educated, whether you have all these other talents, without health, life is miserable. And now you understand the text that says that Christ came in order that we might have life and have it more what? More abundant. Living becomes a joy. It becomes an opportunity and an, appreciate, an appreciation for the life that has been purchased at Calvary. You appreciate living the life that has been given by Christ. Work is in order to sustain this life. It is no longer a drudgery. Because even before Adam fell into sin, there was some physical work that he was to do in tending of the garden of what? Of Eden. Then your mind begins to change. But now, let us continue. Look at the book, uh, Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1070. Bible Commentary, page 6, 1070, where it says, but pardon and justification are one and the same. Pardon and justification are one and the same thing. Pardon and justification are one and the same thing. Yes. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of Christ Jesus not because of an inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him 
as his child by adoption. Christ receives him as his child by adoption. The sinner receives the forgiveness of his sins because these sins are borne by his substitute and surety. And then the Lord from heaven speaks, the Lord speaks to his heavenly father saying, this is my child. Receive, deprive him from the condemnation of death, giving him my life insurance policy, eternal life, because I have taken his place and have suffered for his sins. He is even my beloved son. Thus, man pardoned and clothed with the beautiful garments of Christ's righteousness stands faultless before, before God. So pardon here, we see, and justification are one and the same thing. Justification by faith means you are pardoned of your sins because Christ paid for them. Notice what we have also been reading from Mount of Blessing, page 114. Mount of Blessing, page 114. Where we saw that forgiveness has a broader meaning. Forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. So what, what is part of justification? Because we have seen that pardon and justification are one and the same thing. Pardon is what we call forgive, forgiveness. And here we see what is forgiveness. It has a broader meaning than many suppose that when God gives the promise that he will abundantly pardon, he adds as if the meaning of that promise exceeded all that we would comprehend. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not like we have here on earth, where the judge sets a person free, and the person, the judge, has no power to give to the person to transform their life. The one for God means something else. It is different. It continues. That it is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming Sin. Otherwise, it will not make sense, not give us power to overcome those sins for which he forgave us in the first place. So of redeeming love, we have said that the heart was made to react, to respond to love. And this love is what God manifested at the cross when he sent his only begotten son to die for us. And this, when properly looked at, melts even the hardest heart. So that when he comes from that cross, he wills to obey so that he might not crucify the Son of God again. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. David had the true conception of forgiveness in his faith. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And again he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed, has he removed our transgressions from us. So what is justification? It is pardon. It is forgiveness. In which we are cleansed and reclaimed from sin. Notice we are talking about health reform here and how the light came in order to raise the standard of righteousness so that we might receive even a higher standard of justification or pardon. Pardon from what? We will see as we close in our quotes, mostly from councils on diets and food and other portions of SOP. So we have seen that the Bible calls this a reclaiming from sea cleansing. And part of forgiveness is reclaiming and cleansing. So pardon and justification are one and the same thing. When the light came, it exalted justification tremendously. When health reform came, it brought about a different form of justification. What are we forgiven for? 
It was a subjective act that God did for us, not just an objective thing that happened at the cross. It became more than a paper transaction. When you see Christ, pure, hanging on the cross, you love purity, as Calvary was cleansing, like David in Psalm 51. You accept something for which light has been brought to your conscience. You love righteousness and hate unrighteousness, and they are unclean. You turn from anything that defies. And because what separated you from God has been removed, Jesus takes away those sins. We are not apart from God. Now we are at one with God. Nothing separates. In the book of 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19, 20, now comes to light because we are reconciled. And the Spirit of God in Romans 8, 15 comes to live in us. There is a togetherness because we are accepted in the beloved. Then 1 Corinthians 7.19 makes sense. That do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Notice it says your body. And what kind of house does Christ live in? He cleans us up in body and in spirit. In 1 Corinthians 3.15 and 17. So in your body, this is the health message. Holy, it has to be pure, clean. By, and we get it, we can get the Holy Spirit dwelling in us by removing the garbage. Christ in you, the hope of what? Of glory. He takes over our thoughts. He works in us. So the care of the physical becomes just as important as the spiritual because this is where he actually comes to live. Now this is the light that was different from what the other Christians had prior to this. Because for many years they believed that justification was just a paper transaction. The concept never went beyond a legal transaction, where by faith your sins are removed and you are in right standing before God. But God does not live in you. It does not have anything to do with your physical life and existence here on earth. Yet we are told in the scriptures that even eternal life begins here. So that when you die and you will resurrect because you are in Christ, your life began here and will only be a continuation when Christ comes. It was separate. God is there in heaven. We are here on earth. We are just waiting for the future when he will come and take us home. Yet the life that we are living today, it should not touch any of our habits. Our body is no longer even, what actually it meant is that their body was not the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in the body, notice it says, not the soul, there has to be changes taking place. So while they were reconciled, they were living apart, waiting for some future reconciliation. Notice what Ellen White says as we finish in, this, in the following uh, quotations, bringing to light the new set of law. For uh, example, in uh, Councils on Diets and Foods, page 38. Page 38, paragraph 3. The Lord has given his people a message in regard to health reform. Notice what she calls it. This light, it was light that was not there previously. So this light has been shining upon their pathway for 30 years. This one I don't know was which is. But she says that for 30 years, this light had been shining upon their pathway. And the Lord cannot sustain his servants in a course which will counteract it. 
He is displeased when his servants act in opposition to the message upon this point, which he has given them to give to others. Can he be pleased when half the workers laboring in a place teach that the principles of health reform are as closely allied with the third angel's message as the arm is to the body, while their co-workers by their practice teach principles that are entirely opposite? This is regarded as sin in the sight of who? In the sight of God. The book Temperance, page 238. Temperance, 238. A part of the third angel's message, it says, Brethren and sisters, we want you to see the importance of this temperance question. And we want our workers to interest themselves in it and to know that it is just as much connected with the third angel's message as the right arm is with the body. We ought to make an advancement in this work. We ought to make advancement in this work. Councils on Diets and Food, page 455. This is a sad one. Giving the reason why the Lord is now not working to bring in new converts. It says, the subject of health reform, yes, just the way it was, the subject of health reform has been presented in the churches, but the light has not been heartily received. The selfish, health-destroying indulgences of men and women have counteracted the influence of the message that is to prepare a people for the great day of God. If the churches expect strength, they must leave the truth which God has given them. If the members of our churches disregard the light on this subject, they will reap the sure result in both spiritual and physical degeneracy. And the influence of these older church members, the influence of these older church members will live in those newly come to the faith. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth. This is the context of this statement. Health reform rejected by the older members. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted. Conversion on the issue of health reform. And those who are once converted but who have backslidden. What influence will these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Will they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? So because of this, I remember there was a time I was listening to a minister and he was nearly convincing that if you put the statements of Ellen White together year after year, to the leaders, especially, on health reform. He was nearly convincing me that there was a time when if the leaders had accepted the light on health reform, then it was like it was coming to be, it's called what? A standard of what? Of fellowship. Because I've always wondered, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, especially today, there is no message that is made fun of like this one of health reform by older members, ministers, paid by holy time. Yet, from the pulpit, they make fun and disparage this message. So the Lord is saying, you understand this context, I've read this, uh, this, this statement before, that the Lord does not, does not now work to bring many souls into the truth. 
and it is important to realize that the context is on subject of health reform. God requires his people to accept this light because it exalts righteousness and justification. Because you see, the laws of health, you come to a point where you realize that these laws of health have the same author with the moral laws. And therefore, to transgress the laws of physical health is to transgress, is a sin, because both set of laws have the same author. What a sad situation that we find ourselves in. The book, as we wind up, TSD, TSDF, this is uh, Testimony Studies on Diets and Food or something. TSDF, page 88, paragraph 9 where it starts by saying, men and women, men and women cannot violate, yes, cannot violate natural law by indulging depraved appetite and lustful passion, and not violate the law of God. So are you seeing the connection that was brought Therefore, he has permitted the light of health reform to shine upon us that we may see our sin in violating the laws which he has established in our beings. All our enjoyment or suffering may be traced to obedience or transgression of natural law. Our gracious heavenly father sees the deplorable condition of men who some knowingly but many ignorantly are living in violation of the laws that he has established. And in love and pity to the race, he causes the light to shine upon health reform. He publishes his law and the penalty that will follow the transgression of it, that all may learn and be careful to live in harmony with the natural law. The law that he publishes here is not the moral law, it is the natural law, because now, Sin that was separating man from God has been removed and he lives in us by his Holy Spirit. And life cannot be separated from hell. He proclaims his law so distinctly and makes it so prominent that it is like a city set on a hill. All accountable beings can understand it if they will. Idiots will not be responsible to make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it. Listen to how she finishes is the work that accompanies the third angel's message to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Not the first, not the second. The third angel's message, justification by faith in verity. How low we have sunk when it comes to the issue of health reform. Because we have put it as sanctification. And the time in which it, it, someone should come out of flesh foods and tea and tobacco is up to you. It is not a test of fellowship. Yes, it brings confusion. Especially, I remember one day I was invited to a church and I said, on this point, we need to choose the God that you want to serve. Years back, most people live by a choice of food, whether you are an Adventist or not. We have reached a, a point whereby, even if it is not a, a test of fellowship, no one will come and look into your house and in your utensils what you are eating. The majority of the people have decided that God is far away and they want to practice impunity. Where even in the convocations of the church, the camp meetings, where God is so clear that on those grounds, 
No flesh, tea, and such things should come. They have declared that is where they want to be used. And therefore, it kills the message. Those who are converted, because we have lowered the standard of righteousness, come with the idea that they are separate from God. This physical life has got nothing to do with our spiritual life. And therefore, you find, despite of, we are just looking at a few statements from the spirit of prophecy. We have not even gotten into the, 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 the food uh, that was given to man, the original diet, and why these other flesh things were permitted. And now that we have come to the end where all light has to shine, and the people have to be in a position where they are preparing to meet the Lord. And Ellen White says that this is the diet for those who are waiting for translation. So that when Christ comes, it's only the body that is changed and they are taken right into heaven. We have not even gotten into the story of Daniel. That to clear his mind so that he can be able to, God for him to interpret for him the visions that were being given. They had to eat a specific diet. Because I believe some of those stories are even more powerful than when it is written in the Bible that this is what you are supposed to do. Yet, in our churches, impunity is the name of the game. What God has decided this should not be done, that is what people decide that they are going to do. So I told the people, even in schools, you go to a school, you sign that uh, I will not play music past 10 or something like that. How come in the Seventh-day Adventist church today, because we are in the majority, because we are not converted on this issue of health reform, we have lowered the standard of righteousness. We see no relationship between the physical laws, the natural laws, and the moral law. We do not see that they have the same author. We doubt the statements of Ellen White that those who take tea, it is a sin when you know because tea destroys your health. And the health has been purchased at a high cost at the cross of Calvary. You do not see that relationship. Now we bring those things into the church such that the majority feel like they are outside. I ask them, what do you think will happen? Is it not that we are two churches in one? Because there are people who need to come out. Because the majority have come in. I told them we need to choose what we are going to do. There are so many statements that Ellen White has given that even if you are not going to accept it, please don't stand in the way of health reform. I will finish. Tell me. I want to read a statement that I mentioned. Great controversy, page 149, talking about the Reformation. The Reformation did not, as many suppose, and with Luther, it is to be continued to the close of the world's history. Luther had a great work to do in reflecting to others the light which God had permitted to shine upon him, yet he did not receive all the light which was to be given to the world. From that time to this, new light has been continually shining upon the scriptures, and new truths have been constantly unfolding. For many years, Christians believed that justification was just a paper transaction. But Christ says that I am with you always. Now we are the sons of God. When he lives in me, I will wish to glorify him in my body. Christians believe that that work was done apart from them, yet it was done for them. But the time had come where we needed to see that the laws of health are the laws of God. We do not keep them to be righteous, but because we live in the presence of a holy one. It is a real and transactional thing that took place. At the cross, atonement took place, cleansing, acceptance and reconciliation. One act for sin, problem, but with many aspects. And when I look at the cross, how self-denying Christ was, in fact, Christ came and began the work where Adam fell on the point of appetite. I will not think about my stomach. I will not think about my taste buds. 
and lust and selfishness. At Calvary, all these things are suppressed. Likeness to Jesus is self-denial. Health reform is precious light that raised the standard of righteousness. Because what we are forgiven for when you are being justified is what you are reclaimed from. And unless Adventists teach health reform as part and parcel of the third angel's message, then we are not going to meet with much success. Because after that, what you are reclaimed from, reclaimed from is the breaking even of the natural. Satan became furious when this message came, especially when it is taught as part of justification by faith. He rages and will fight it vigorously. We have looked upon this as darkness for so long, and if we are not careful, we will be walking in darkness and we will not be distinguishing truth from error anymore. How I wish that we would read these statements and look at what new light is, and what was received by them, that you might not go back and retreat into darkness when precious light was given unto us. Combined with the light that Wagner and Jonas brought, Christ in the law, we have seen from the book The Desire of Ages, that we will not be alive today. Every bread that we eat, every article of food and drop of water is because of what Christ did at Calvary. May God continue to open our eyes that we might walk this path. There is a statement that I will not read in the book, Councils and Diets and Foods. Shows the experience of those who will be teaching correctly this message. The opposition that they will be meet, that they will be meeting, they are told should not be discouraging to them. May God bless us as we continue to think upon these things in Jesus' name. We will pray as you get comments. Our Father, we come before you to thank you once again for the opportunity that you have given us to study this deep truth in thy word. Father, may you enlarge our capacity to love by enlarging our capacity to understand, Father, your laws, both the moral and the natural ones. Father, that we might be forgiven much, that we might be able to love you much and ask for your grace, Father, in order to live in accordance to your will. Even as we prepare for what is coming upon this world, that this message may be able to protect us after we have received it. Be with us even for the rest of the programs, for this is our prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen.